Thank you, Steve. Hi, everyone. Hi. I am so happy to be here. I love talking about user training with system admins. So yes, I have been a Salesforce system admin and a trainer since 2010. And for several years prior to that, I was responsible for a lot of different types of sales training, product training, process, system technology training. And every time I introduced a new technology to sales users, they loved it. No, that's not true. That is not true. It was disruptive and it took their focus off of selling. So they didn't love it and they still needed to learn it. So I had to work out strategies to get these sales users to really learn what they needed to know and then actually get them to do it. Now, I know from spending time with you that most of you are not trainers by trade. You're IT pros, or maybe you are in sales management, or you're a power user from the sales team or marketing team. And if you're in sales, you know this. You know that introducing new technologies to sales and marketing can be tricky. So in this webinar, I'm going to give you a few hacks, five hacks, to make you look like you are a pro system trainer. I've tried to time this out so we have about 10 minutes at the end for some questions. So first, Let's acknowledge something. Anytime you are asking users to learn a new system, especially something significant like Salesforce, that is a change. And people react to change in different ways. I like to look at change reactions like a continuum. Over on the far left, we've got the resistors, the ones that just dig in. They're not convinced that they'll be successful with this change. They immediately, maybe it's their personality, but they immediately just see all the flaws. They have all these questions. They don't trust whoever was in charge of the change and they resist. And then as you keep going on the spectrum, you've got your people that are more neutral. They're gonna wait and see what happens, which side should they fall on. And then you've got your people who are gonna advocate because they just, they're positive. They they believe that good things can happen. They trust the people who are working on this change. They're ready to get on board, support it, learn what they need to learn, and adopt the change. And then you've got your early adopters who are going to get in there as quick as they can. They want early access. They want to be beta testers. They love new stuff. They want to influence it to make sure that it works for them. And your role, you play a pretty significant role in influencing how people can react to this change and how readily they will adopt it. Because that's what we're going for, right? Maximum adoption, maximum number of people that are over to the far right side of this continuum. I do recommend that you do more research on managing change and understanding the role of the trainer and the role of IT in a change initiative because there's so much you could understand about this that would definitely increase your adoption rates and increase the chances of your organization realizing the cost savings and time savings that led to this change in the first place. And most of what I'm sharing in this webinar is built around the scenario where you're introducing Salesforce to new groups of users. I know not all the training you're doing is about a major change for groups of people. Sometimes it's just a few new hires or one user that's moved into a new role, for example. The principles that I'm going to share, they'll still apply, but you might need to modify some of the hacks for that scenario. So thinking about training in the midst of a change, all to achieve maximum impact, maximum adoption, and you're not a training professional, here are some hacks. Hack number one, if you can pull it off, don't train managers in the same session as their direct reports. Now this is as much of a change management strategy as it is a training strategy. Typically, we train people in their work teams, learning alongside each other, being learners in front of each other. Now there are a lot of reasons why this is a good idea, except when you see it in real practice and you see what I've seen, which is this. Leaders don't always want to be learners in front of their team. I don't want to make a blanket statement about all leaders, but I've seen this dynamic enough where I want to flag it for you. For many leaders, this is a really vulnerable position for them to be in, especially if that leader is not totally confident in their technology skills. Plus, when you've got everybody grouped together, it misses an opportunity for that leader, the supervisor, the team lead, the director, for them to be an advocate for Salesforce in that training to be a bit out in front of the team so that they can play the role of reassuring, advocating, and modeling expected usage for their team. And if that leader has questions or really strong input or observations or changes that must be made, you want to know that input before it is said in front of the staff. Because here's what I know for sure. If you have a percentage of your users who are on the spectrum of neutral, wait and see, to resisting, 
they will latch on to any perceived flaw as a reason to just wait. I'm going to wait for this to be prime time ready before I spend time learning it. And that drops your adoption rates significantly. And people who are worried about their ability to learn this platform, they will use any signal from leadership as a way to hang back and not adopt the new system. So training managers as their own separate group, it allows you to answer all their questions, address all their concerns from that group in private, and then move them over to the right on our change spectrum so that they show up in front of the team advocating for the new system, knowledgeable, able to answer questions themselves. And if after that training, the managers are not quite there yet, then your system may not be ready for further rollout to the team. If the leaders are full on board embracing this change, they get it, they understand how it all works, then you're ready for hack number two. Get leaders to present some of the content during training to the team. Yeah, you heard me right. Get the supervisor, the manager, the director to co-train with you. Give them a job to present some of the content. This establishes that leader as a go-to for how the system works. You know what I see a lot? And honestly, as a manager, I don't totally get it. But when I'm training Salesforce to intact teams, I see the manager, the sales leader, that marketing director, when we're talking about Salesforce, these leaders, I know they have a different workflow, like their hands on the keyboard, they are doing different tasks in Salesforce than those frontline contributors. So what I see those people do is they come to training and they're kind of checked out, not really paying attention, or they come for the first 15 minutes, but they've got another meeting that they have to go to because they think they don't really have to learn what the team has to learn. Their daily tasks are different. So unfortunately, this sets the tone for how important this training really is for the rest of the team. And now, also, that supervisor or manager doesn't deeply know how it all works. This causes two issues from my experience. If this new system is not readily adopted and that leader was kind of checked out, it is so much easier for the users to blame the system or worse, blame the training. And read between the lines there, they're blaming you. Secondly, if users get stuck and they are unsure how to perform a specific work function or finish a certain flow, in the early days, it is really, really easy to blame Salesforce for this, right? This thing doesn't work or I tried that. I don't have that button. I don't have that field. I don't have that tab. And a leader who doesn't know the system very well will believe them. But if that leader had more training time with you and was a little bit out in front of where the end users were and was delivering a little bit of the content and seen as a knowledgeable expert, none of that will fly. Instead, that leader has an opportunity to say things like, oh, that's weird. Show me. Let me see that. Let's go. Let's show me the screen where that's happening. Or if it's a real issue, be able to explain to you how it should work and what's not working about how the way it's set up. But if that leader has had a little more training time with you and was asked by you to be in the role of a go-to resource and a co-trainer, when issues come up that sound like a training issue or a system issue, but they're really an adoption issue, that leader can quickly redirect and you don't have to get roped into all those situations. Which leads us nicely into hack number three. I want you to push for clear expectations from leadership about usage expectations. I'm sorry, I said expectations twice right there, but you get it, right? People need to be told what's expected of them. So it's not necessarily your job to communicate that, but you need to request that. Part of the communication strategy around implementing the change is not just, hey, it's available now, training's next week on Tuesday. I want you to request clear communication about cutoff dates and expectations. It's really common to hear, if it's not in Salesforce, it didn't happen. If your notes aren't in Salesforce, if the task isn't logged or the, lo the call isn't logged in Salesforce, that call didn't happen. So you need to be requesting that leadership clearly communicate the expectation. If these users are not told clearly what they're expected to do, when to do it, how to do it, why to do it, it leaves the door open for them to keep it all fuzzy and possibly sabotage your effort to introduce this new technology. In my perspective, when Salesforce doesn't really stick and it's not adopted, it is generally because the communication and expectations around usage, data cleanliness, and logging and tracking information was kept fuzzy. So what I like to say about this is, 
the system will normalize. If this change is big enough and people are afraid of their ability to really adopt it and are unclear about the expectations, they will try to normalize back to the way it was. So that's the phrase I keep in mind. The system will normalize. I'm going to give you an image to help you really get this. So do you remember that movie Terminator 2? Of course you do. Okay, so you remember that robot cop shapeshifter guy, the T-1000 for us super nerds out there? So the T-1000, he's that like cop that runs around and gets shot and all this crazy stuff happens to him. So there's this scene where the Schwarzenegger character shoots the T-1000 and he shatters into like these tiny mercury-like pieces, like thousands of little tiny mercury blobs. And it seemed like that bad guy was a goner. But then those tiny pieces start to come back together forming bigger and bigger blobs and all the blobs are reconnected back into the bad robot guy. Remember that? So this is what I think of when the system will normalize. You come in and you're like, we're doing Salesforce. Salesforce is the new CRM. Boom. You have just exploded their world. And if you are not on top of it, those little mercury blobs of the system, they will regroup themselves back together and they will work so hard to reform back into the way things used to be. So you've got to be in front of it. I have seen this happen. I can't tell you how many times I have been brought in to quote, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see them, relaunch Salesforce because either training wasn't done in the beginning or it wasn't clearly communicated how it was supposed to be used, how often, by who, and what data was supposed to be put in there. So your strategy for hack number three is clear communications early, early, early so that everyone's clear about how the system will be used so that those mercury blobs can't reform. Which brings us to hack number four, let people learn on their own. Because our typical approach is, as a system admin, I am the most familiar with Salesforce. I know how it works. I know where to click. I know how to create that new report. I know how to create an account and attach a contact. I'll teach everybody. And we lock people in a room or put them on a virtual meeting and we end up doing a point and click tour of Salesforce. But that misses so much. It misses the core information that people need. And I know this because I teach these classes. People are sitting there wanting to know, how do I actually get my work done in Salesforce? The work I do, the nuances of that work. And then how do, where, how do I see that data later? That's what people are really needing to understand. And a point and click tour of Salesforce just doesn't get them there. Adults do really well learning that stuff on their own. Well, you know that. You use CBT Nuggets for your training. So any of those basics point and click things that you can make available to them, and it's something you trust, do that so that you can reserve the live time with you, the system expert, and with leadership to understand more than the basics. Like still do the live sessions. Don't give that up. Just don't use it to do the basics. Instead, when you bring people together in some live time together, virtual meetings or, or in-person meetings, use that time to clarify concepts, answer questions about the system, but also they're going to have more questions about where's this data? I used to keep track of my meeting notes here. Where did that stuff go? Plus the next level of detail, you're going to have specific work processes, specific fields that are populated, specific types of data that they're not going to totally understand where that stuff ended up or where it's supposed to be put. Where do I put meeting notes now? Do I need to log every call? Do I have to log every single interaction? The point and click basic tour will show them how to do it. The live time with you and leadership is where to put stuff, why to do it, how often to do it. So that's what the live time should be reserved for. Plus, you might consider doing some hands-on exercises, which is hack number five. Get hands-on. So the typical approach that we've been talking about up to this point is we give them the point and click tour and then we let them go and thinking, okay, now they get it. And then they go practice on their real work. So I see a couple things go south with this. First, if people aren't totally confident in their skills, they end up not populating things at all or they wait and they hold back and adoption just takes a long time because they're unsure. People need to practice. So the second thing that I see go south with this is um, you get a bunch of dirty data in the system. Things get converted too early or they're not converted correctly or they're input into the system but not managed and you get a whole bunch of junk data in there early or you get stuff that was put in half populated 
And then your first two, three months, you end up with a lot of dirty data. And this is right after you spent weeks cleaning up that data before you loaded it into Salesforce. So my recommendation is rather than use the lifetime for the point and click tour, use that time with the experts, with sales leadership to let them practice real work scenarios. Give them some scenarios about lead management, lead conversion, cases if you're working with a sales a service support, so that they're actually going through entire work processes and getting confident that they know how the system works. So they've already built up their competence through the self-paced training. These live sessions with the experts are to build up their confidence that they do know what's expected of them. They know what's going to happen when they start to click buttons. They have a chance to ask questions, clarify anything between you and sales leaders about what they're supposed to be doing. So use that live time with the experts to get hands on. And then you and sales leadership or marketing leadership can also confirm who's getting it, who isn't, who maybe needs a little bit more support and direction as they're getting their confidence up to really use this system. Because remember, back to our whole change management model, the goal is get people from this far left of being resistors and neutral moved over to either like neutral to advocating for a lot of them is pretty realistic into advocating really strongly confident. When you move farther to the right, it's just as more confidence, more competence that they really do know what they're doing in Salesforce. And that's really what it comes down to because at the end of the day, training is the strategy for adopting a new technology system that you're responsible for rolling out. So to sum it all up for you, you're gonna look to train your managers separate from members of their team. Then you're gonna get them to co-train with you. You're gonna get clear communication for your users about expectations around usage. You're gonna let people learn the basics on their own, where they can, what they can learn on their own, you're gonna let them. And then you're gonna use live time to get hands-on working in groups, working on real work scenarios. I hope this has been informative. No, just kidding. I'm not going to say that. Actually, I'm going to say, hey, I hope this has been informative. Now, ask me some questions. <laughs>